research in themed and immersive spaces at the threshold of identity. In 2013, while conducting research at a famous themed outdoor mall, I was confronted by three security guards. During a conversation, I discovered that the three had approached me because, in their words, I looked strange, particularly as I was seen talking to my video camera and filming aspects of the quasi-public space. I explained that I was a researcher of themed and immersive spaces and that I shoot such video for my YouTube page, which features some of the results of my research. I was told that I had to cease my shooting of the video, but that I could remain in the space. I ended up leaving right after the altercation occurred. Later, in my perusal of some of the video that I had shot at this mall, I discovered that one of the guards had his hands on his mace during the entire encounter, presumably meaning that he was willing and able to use the prep pepper spray if needed. Two years later, while taking similar video at a famous California mall in the South, one that had been on my list of inspiring themed and immersive spaces to visit, I had a similar though much more pleasant encounter with the guard who informed me that I was forbidden from shooting video. Again, I explained my research and even provided him with a flyer for my book on themed and immersive spaces, an item that I began to keep on my person after the incident in 2013. Once again, I left the space without having fully completed my filming. In the same year, I had a third such incident of this sort while taking some still photographs of the small but elaborately themed casino in Nevada. In this case, I was accosted by an irate server who became upset with my photography and shouted at the top of her lungs, you may not take photography in here. Her voice was so dramatic that I decided to immediately make my way to the exit. So much for the theming. I thought as I exited the parking lot. These three incidents are presented as an introduction to the type of research that I have been engaged in for the last 20 or more years. I am a cultural anthropologist who studies themed and immersive spaces, theme parks, casinos, themed restaurants, museums, heritage sites, and various other consumer lifestyle spaces. I also used to be an employee trainer at Six Flags Astroworld in Houston, Texas. And in the many years since I worked there, I have gained new appreciation for the understanding and analysis of the variety of themed and immersive spaces that I study. In this research, I wish to use the context of my research to offer new insights about theming and immersion. The title of my chapter addresses two senses of these terms. Theming, or a theme, refers to a foundational topic or issue that is the focus of one's speech, a proposition, deposit, or something set down, while immersion indicates a situation in which one is plunged in or dipped into something or is absorbed in some situation or interest. When I speak of research in themed and immersive spaces, I intend to focus on the meanings of theming and immersion both in the sites of concern, their deployments in the consumer spaces that I study, and in the context of contemporary postmodern ethnographic research, particularly as contemporary ethnography has, spoke, has focused on specific thematics of research and writing, and as classic Malinowskian participant observation has privileged the notion of immersion as a site-based research strategy. I will endeavor to connect these two domains of the terms with specific emphasis on the issue of identity, whose meaning of sameness or oneness suggests an opportunity or even a need to create more dialogue between the two worlds entailed in my work. To return to my opening field anecdotes, let me suggest some concerns that govern this research. First, while nothing in my encounters is necessarily unique to participant observation field settings, after all, any ethnographer is likely to encounter research hurdles that make the work more challenging and sometimes impossible to complete. There is a rather curious dynamic to research that is conducted in consumer spaces. I would argue that this dynamic involves the desire of the anthropologist to become more immersed in the space and the will of the many social control agents to sometimes prevent that immersion. So, I wish to draw attention to some of the unique circumstances of this research in themed and immersive spaces and indicate some possible trajectories 
that future study might follow. Along with this concern is a second that relates to the position of such sites and their accompanying research in the context of contemporary ethnography. Quite surprisingly, for all of the everydayness and public popularity of these spaces, they remain understudied, especially by American anthropologists. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to meet an anthropologist who had written such a book that related to the analysis of consumer spaces. When I expressed my excitement about that study, the author replied, Yes, that was just a fun study that I didn't put much effort into. At the time, I was shocked to hear this, but later I realized that this is the attitude that governs the spaces that I study. They are not worthy of serious research and certainly not by an anthropologist. This reminds of a third overarching issue, or the fact that so many analyses of themed and immersive spaces are represented by overly generalized writing. For example, hypothetically, I walked down Main Street USA at Disney and found the entirety of the space to be so hegemonic and consumerist in nature. Such writing expresses the lack of first-person on-the-ground research that addresses either or both of the domains of the consumption practices of guests and workers and the design practices of those who create public consumer spaces. In fact, these analyses are characterized not so much by on-the-ground phenomenological research, but by research essays or editorials that make vast and sweeping generalizations about people in the spaces, that is, when people actually appear in such writing. I will argue for the expansion of research in themed and immersive spaces such that we begin to see the nuances of the spaces, their guests, workers, and designers, more so than we see the opinions of the authors. Finally, I will suggest that there are wide-scale, game-changing shifts in media, popular culture, public space, and existential reality that necessarily impact, and often at dramatic levels, the study of consumer space, especially as guests and designers of them are engaged in their own forms of research. An entropic state of research. Entropy, which suggests a turning inward transformation or general decline or disorder of a system, has a dynamic relationship to the research conducted in themed and immersive spaces. As a worker and anthropologist at Six Flags Astroworld, I became very familiar with this concept as each and every day of work in the park related to some pending disorder that employees needed to prevent. The sense of a disaster on the horizon is related to the public nature of these spaces, their overwhelming scale of concern, particularly for theme parks that have thousands of employees, tens of thousands of guests in a given day, and many potential mishaps that can occur to park rides, shows, and attractions, and very tenuous brands to protect in a marketing sense. Since the years that I worked at Astroworld, my research has evolved in such ways that the entropy I experience no longer relates to that disorder that I noted and often tried to prevent as a worker in a consumer space, but to the context of the research itself as a site of disorder. My opening examples involve three consumer spaces, and these could be seen metaphorically as apt expressions of the nature of the research that I am describing. As I suggested earlier, there is resistance within academia to the immersive studies of consumer spaces that I am describing in this work. As well, there is considerable challenge that ethnographers experience when they are on site and attempt to capture the essence of a space that is presumably open and public in nature. Of course, it doesn't take long for the researcher to realize that such space is not truly public and that certain uses of that same space, whether for research, an artistic project, or even political action, will be forbidden. Initially, when I reflected on the first encounter that I had with security guards in 2013, I felt quite inept, thinking that I should have made an effort to arrange a press meeting, something that I had done in many other research visits to theme parks and other spaces. Later, as I reflected more on the incident, it occurred to me that the outcome was ironically a desirable one, especially as it pointed to a trope of my research, this the loss of control. For many ethnographers, a loss of control experienced in the course of field research may be an undesirable state, 
But I would like to suggest that in the context of the study of popular culture, particularly its consumer spaces, the entropic state that I have experienced in my own research is particularly important. During the course of my work in the worlds of themed and immersive spaces, I have moved from the position of a pure ethnographer of these spaces to a consultant working in them. This has not been a particularly easy transition, but again, this speaks to a desired state of process in terms of my ethnographic work. On one occasion, I was asked to provide anthropological guidance on a project related to themed and immersive spatial design. I cannot directly comment on the event since I am bound by a non-disclosure agreement, but let me suggest that the event was particularly instructive for me as I began to again experience the situation in which my own agency as a professional anthropologist was challenged. Initially, I expected to enter the consulting events with a sense of power due to my presumed expertise as an anthropologist and theme park insider. The projects involved focus on my knowledge as it related to cultural systems that were being analyzed, produced, and remade by the participants. As time went on, I discovered that I was less and less able to express my expertise about cultural systems and themed spaces because of the, de the designers involved were operating from different paradigms than those often employed by anthropologists. My frustration turned to delight as I began to witness the unfolding of the seminars. This included fascination with being able to see how a theme space is created in a generative sense, and also a curiosity with the fact that the participants in the seminars were essentially engaging in their own research protocols. As Douglas Holmes and George Marcus have argued more and more, contemporary ethnographic research is determined by an uneasy collaboration between ethnographers and informants. A more complex scene of multiple levels, sites, and kinds of associations in terms of the field. This changing scene of the ethnographic, which I have identified through the theme of entropy, may suggest to traditional researchers a sense of loss. In fact, I believe that such loss represents an emerging ethos for research. More specifically, George Marcus has written of the crisis of representation that has impacted contemporary ethnography and he has suggested the need to revise outdated models of ethnographic research such that fieldwork will begin to parallel the complexities, uncertainties, and fluctuations that are representative of the postmodern world at large. Combined with other emergent epistemological and methodological innovations, such as actor network theory, new ethnographic approaches illustrate the potentiality of research in spaces of consumer and popular culture, particularly as such research represents a struggle to cope with loss, entropy, and other social and cultural forces that are on the horizon. Actor network theory in particular represents an exciting opportunity for the study of these spaces, in no small part for the fact that it both recognizes the complexity of the social world in terms of any particular thing, entity, or context, and suggests a relational model that situates such complexity in processes of interpretation, translation, and convergence. Applied to the venues of theme parks and other themed and immersive spaces, we leave behind the model of the lone researcher who visits any such space as a solitary, detached, and omniscient individual, and instead welcome an approach that addresses the complexity, ambiguity, relationality, convergence, and complicity that are implied in the space, its researcher, and its many, many actors, human and non-human. It should be noted that such reformulation of the research conducted in consumer spaces need not be interpreted as a loss of objectivity or an admission of guilt, as some have suggested in terms of the crisis of representation within contemporary cultural anthropology. In fact, the reformulation of research in the wake of entropic cultural forces suggests a coming to terms with the changing world and a desire to engage new researchers in this complex, though methodologically and epistemologically inhabitable, arena. It is also important to note that one of the results of both the crisis of representation in the social sciences and the adoption of more complex models of the world, such as uh, actor network theory, is a notable effect on the status and identity of the researcher involved in the field of study. Material expressions of the surface and experiments beyond. 
The consulting seminars that I have described began with considerations of the material cues realized through images, associations, mood boards, and the like that are often part of a charade or other planning session that establishes the basis of a consumer space. I did not participate in future seminars with these designers, so it is unlikely that the, convention, that the conversations continue to focus only on the materiality of the design process. But it is curious to me that the seminars that I did experience focused so exclusively on the material expressions of theming. In striking parallel with social critics of theme spaces, the participants in the seminar seem to have suggested that theming was best understood or designed through its obvious material expressions. The study of any form of theming, whether a lived or experienced version like this depicted here of Civil War reenactment, or more material or atmospheric versions like that of, say, the Venetian theme casino in Las Vegas, necessitates deep questions about what exactly constitutes the theming. For an ethnographer of Civil War reenactment communities, the initial perceptions of the theming being a material phenomenon with the varied symbols of guns, tents, costumes, and historical and period accoutrements may shift into insights of theming as a lived, phenomenological, emotional, and affective entity. Ethnographic studies of theming, in dramatic contrast with analyses of social critics, emphasize the total holistic nature of theming. In Civil War reenactment, the combination of material cues, performative practices, phenomenological happenings, and existential conditions all matter in terms of understanding the foundations of this form of theming. A significant proportion of the literature on theme spaces, however, has eschewed this focus on the holistic and ethnographic nature of theming and has instead emphasized domains of concern that include authenticity, hegemony, consumerism, and corporatism. While these are significant issues that do have direct bearing on the understanding of theming, these concerns, as part of a discursive worldview, have certainly impacted the perceptions that academics and laypersons have of specific theme spaces, theme communities, and lifestyles, as well as theming as an overall construct in consumer society. General perceptions of theming noted on social media sites and through internet searches, for example, include sensibilities that theme spaces and theme communities like those of Civil War reenactment are characteristic of shallowness, campiness, inauthenticity, overt consumerism, and tourism run amok. With this general discursive construct of theming in mind, the study of theming is particularly challenging as guest workers and designers alike may sometimes privilege discourse that is focused on the material expressions of theming as opposed to those expressions of phenomenological, ideological, political, and existential contexts that are often considered in the study of reenactment communities. Given the fact that theming relies on certain material, architectural, and performative cues, some of which could be considered stereotypical in nature, it is not surprising that so much of the discourse related to it is focused on these non-ideational facets. The challenge, however, exists in the ethnographic desire to consider seriously the phenomenological, affective, and existential states beyond the material expressions of the theming. Take as an example here. The account of a family enjoying a gondolier ride at the Venetian Las Vegas. A critic, whether having observed the account or not, may likely focus on the material cues present in the situation. The gondolier, the architecture, the gondola, and so forth and connect these presumably surface details to the idea of the family being duped in the situation at hand. An ethnographic observation of the same situation would necessitate that the analysis of the material cues be balanced by a focus on the lived and existential characteristics of the people actually within the event. Workers in such service industry spaces would argue that the gondolier's status as a performer within that space is much more complex than, than the accounts within the literature on theming would suggest. The same could be said for analyses of the family within the space. Their behaviors, sensibilities, and motivations could fall between engagement and apathy, enjoyment and even dread. Unfortunately, and somewhat ironically, the focus on the surface elements of theming's materiality within the discursive world of theming criticism has resulted in similar superficiality in the understanding of the actors involved in the spaces of theming. The focus on the materiality of the event, 
The surface, metaphorically, reminds of the classic, though now heavily critiqued, notion of the inside-outside, the emic and etic distinction in anthropology. While I cannot delve into this debate in detail, let me say that a very simple requirement for the research of themed and immersive spaces is to consider aspects of the spaces beyond the material. This sounds somewhat simplistic and obvious, but this fact alone speaks to the incredible dearth of phenomenological research in these themed and immersive worlds. In this case, we might agree that the trope of immersion, surprisingly enough, should be considered as an appropriate means of engaging these spaces. Not surprisingly, for the critic or researcher who feels that he or she is above the object of study, in these recent examples, the stereotypical Las Vegas casino, it is difficult, if not impossible, for that researcher to engage the space in question by becoming immersed in it. This is, however, exactly what needs to take place. In my own ethnographic observations of Las Vegas theming, I have begun a series of videographic experiments that in many ways mimic the approaches of the typical Las Vegas tourists. Internet searches of Las Vegas Strip or themed casinos will result in some interesting popular results, many of which are YouTube videos. After analyzing these many videos, I decided to create my own videos that, through, that though based in a research protocol, typically one focus on the theming of a given casino, were primarily voiced through a tourist or guest lens. These experiments, though often focus on the materiality of the theme spaces, imagine a space of the mind and attempt to posit what experiences for typical guests are like in such spaces. The videos have the appearance of a tourist review film that is quite common on YouTube, yet they feign a sense of research in that the focus of each film is on an anthropological or design dynamic that would not be typically found in a tourist video. I see this hybridity of the form as an example of the blurring of the lines of immersion, those of the theme space and those of traditional anthropology, and also as a focus on the further blurring of the lines between the popular internet and social media research and traditional academic research. A second example of pushing the precarious dynamics of the material and ideational expressions of theming relates to a research group that began in 2012. The group includes two academics, Filippo Carla and Florian Freitag of Theme Spaces, the second of whom is also a former Paris Disneyland employee, myself and a fourth colleague, Gordon Grice, who is a professional designer of theme spaces. The activities of the research group have included the traditional considerations of theming at academic conferences, but most intriguing have been a series of on-site research visits to a number of theme parks and subsequent email conversations. As in the other cases that I have described, the initial considerations of the theme spaces began with the obvious material cues of theming. But what followed was a curious di and dynamic discussion of the ideational aspects of the spaces. As an example, while conducting a field visit at Universal Studios Hollywood, Carla Freitag and I had opportunities to engage in in-depth discussions about the representations of the past in various park attractions, notably the Revenge of the Mummy ride pictured here, as well as consider the issue of auto-theming or the ways in which a theme park expresses reflexively sensibilities about itself, its industry, or its meta-representations. Additionally, on another visit to both Disneyland and Disney California Adventure, we were joined by Gordon Grice. His expertise in the design of themed and immersive spaces was particularly valuable as we were able to pose questions to him about the interplay of the various dynamics of theming, including design, execution and implementation, guest responses in the park, and other matters. What was most insightful for me was our implicit focus on the differences and the paralleling of academic critical design praxis focus and popular entertainment-based discourses about themed spaces. These research protocols and many others suggest opportunities for future research experiments in themed and immersive spaces. A made-up theme park. In 2015, I made a brief research trip to Robber's Roost Antiques and Collectibles, a small and otherwise unassuming store on California Highway 14 in Nino Kern, California. Robber's Roost had long been on my theming radar 
as I had read that the store had created a rather unique and imaginative ghost town. This theme space is a challenge to describe, but very generally, it is a small space spread over a few acres that includes a number of enclosed theme structures. I discovered that the current owners of the site, who it should be noted also own a modern unthemed convenience store next to the theme town, they purchased the, Mo the Mojave Desert Inn and Station and then began the slow process of transforming the old motel rooms and accompanying buildings into a themed ghost town. It is actually a bit of a misstatement to describe the site as a ghost town. While it does have elements that one finds in such a themed space, the way that it develops the space, and notably through techniques of inventive bricolage and beguiling narratives in the form of signage and other texts, suggests that it is far from a typical ghost town. The various spaces within the site include the ubiquitous jailhouse, complete with an interesting combination of a door-sized Christian cross and a buy something by anything sign that greets the visitor. You can see those here. And then next, pictured here, a uh, somewhat Hans uh, Balmer-like stuffed dummies and texts uh, like, my old lady can go to hell. And then next, as you can see here, a big rock garden with four rather unremarkable, I suppose, big rocks. And then next, there's actually a sign that says museum that leads to a museum, and I couldn't discover that particular museum. And then next, pictured here, as you can see, this quite interesting uh, space, a water tower that has been rethemed with discarded and repurposed telephones, complete with misspellings of common words. And then next, we get a space here, as you can see labeled on the door, is house. And it is themed somewhat like a typical house, but the arrangements have been adapted for more aesthetic purposes. You can see here a pile of paintings on a chair that is displayed with an odd juxtaposition with other objects in the room. And most curious for me is this next and final representation here. You can see a chair, and on it is a discarded door lock tumbler from any typical door. And you can't see this so well in the image, but it is a uh, Support Our Troops sticker. In fact, I believe that Robber's Roost represents an avant-garde vision of theming that invites us to ruminate on a meta-discourse about theming and immersion. In some respects, the space shares innovative design approaches with Tio's Tacos in Riverside, California, which I have pictured here with their very interesting uh, bricolage art. Both of these spaces illustrate what has been called outsider or folk art. art. As artist Jean Dubuffet said of such work, it is created, quote, from solitude and from pure and authentic creative impulses, where the worries of competition, acclaim, and social promotion do not interfere, end quote. Folk art, bricolage, and indigenous repurposing, as Alan F. Roberts describes, suggests a critical awareness of space, culture, and design, and indicates a sensibility of irony with its various meta underpinnings. In the case of Robber's Roost and Tio's Tacos, we have a much different project of theming and immersion. While each space does suggest an awareness of the common elements of theming and immersion, and likely invites guests to the spaces to enjoy them as they would more traditional venues, each also portends a simultaneously marvelous and disruptive discourse about theming and immersion. As researchers, after visiting spaces like these, we cannot, we cannot help but focus on how these spaces are the future of theming. They are reflexive and in some ways too critical and too ironic in how they remake the discourses of theming. And we cannot avoid considering the, quote, mistakes that we might discover in failed theme parks like Hard Rock Park, you can actually see here images of the rather body urinals that were part of this interesting, interesting theme park on the East Coast. And we can certainly discover in parks like Hard Rock, Rock Park the design directions that could have never been materialized in the typical corporate theme space, and also the winks, ironic ploys, and unanswered questions that are more commonly found in a conceptual museum like the Museum of Jurassic Technology.
in such ways that we are left asking new questions about these other spaces beyond their environs that they reference. In another important respect, these conceptual theme spaces suggest a reworking of the dynamics that are typically involved in the study of consumer spaces. Grant McCracken, in his work Culturematics, speaks of a new era of consumer society in which everyday individuals are remaking the popular world around us by deploying their own forms of cultural research. Robber's Roost and Tio's Tacos are expressions of such culturematics as they represent a reworking of both the material and the discursive statements of theming and immersion of the past. As McCracken writes, a culturematic is a little machine for making culture, designed to do three things, test the world, discover meaning, and unleash value. Beyond these material constructions, we may imagine additional examples of culturematics that similarly move forward the discourses of theming and immersion, as well as the research that is focused on its analysis. As I referenced earlier in an experiment involving YouTube, contemporary discourse about theming and immersion is very much constituted in the various media, social media, and other crowd-based spaces on the internet and on mobile media. Social critics have largely ignored these reflections of theming and have thus limited our understandings of its nature and have prevented us from discovering these new research insights from the popular crowdsource world. While there are hints of a new constitutive approach to the study of themed and immersive spaces, and it seems to me that Edward's, Edward Bruner's work on the multiple forms of authenticity present in tourist spaces is one example, there is a need for the development of truly collaborative, interfaced, and constitutive approaches to such research. As well, as I argued earlier, high time it is to jettison traditional models and interpretations of popular and consumer culture and the themed and immersive spaces that such culture entails. New theoretical and methodological approaches, such as that of actor network theory, suggest that any given space, including these insurgent or avant-garde versions that I have examined, be understood as a complex product of multiple actors, human and non-human, and actions, contexts, seen and unseen, interpretations, implicit and explicit, images and memes, extant and extinct, and numerous other multiplicities of the world. Future directions of, of research in themed and immersive spaces. Describing the tendencies of research that may take place in themed and immersive spaces years from now is akin to predicting the nature of how these same spaces will appear in the future. Both are challenging matters due to the changes, fluctuations, and uncertainties in the worlds of technology, economics, and popular culture that, no doubt, befuddle the researcher and designer of themed and immersive spaces alike. Let me suggest five specific trajectories of research to come in themed and immersive spaces. First, as I have alluded to earlier, Subsequent research in these consumer spaces need take into account the reconceptualizations of the social and research worlds as suggested by actor network theory. Using actor network theory's complex models that were first tested in the social worlds of science and technology, we may begin to apply them to popular consumer culture in order to stimulate new interpretations, conversations, and collaborations related to the spaces that we study. Imagine just for a moment if we resist the previous configurations of our research as consisting of a solitary, disconnected, and heroic figure of the critic researcher of themed and immersive spaces, such as in the work of Ada Louise Huxtable, Paul Goldberger, and others, and instead imagine the same researcher as one node among many other nodes and multiplicities within the field known as themed and immersive space. Second, and quite related to the first, is the tendency in which we witness the changing status and identity of the researcher. I began this chapter with a focus on the failures or perhaps difficulties in the research process, not to suggest the impossibility of the project, but to allow more effective rumination on how such challenges inform the research and offer some pathways forward. In the case of ethnographic research and other fieldwork forms that follow in the wake of the crisis of representation, the avant-garde, postmodern epistemology, and cutting-edge research protocols like those of actor network theory, we realize that all share in common the tendency to cast doubt on or otherwise ask new and probing questions of 
the researcher in the middle of it all. Thus, I argue that reflexive research and the complex interactions that it creates between subject and object, space and criticism, theory and practice, event and representation, results in the researcher developing a more tenuous and unstable relationship with the field. In the case of the study of theme spaces, the notion of ethnographic complicity is a prominent voice. And here's the quote that I'm sharing from George Marcus. As he writes, the spaces of contemporary research suggest access to a construction of an imaginary for fieldwork that can only be shaped by complicitous alliance with makers of visionary or anticipatory knowledge who are already in the scene or within the bounds of the field. The imaginaries of knowledge makers are what the dreams of contemporary ethnography are made of. Thus, future research in these venues may be more balanced in terms of the deployment of forms of cultural critique, perhaps critical in some cases and empathetic in others, and may be better able at illustrating the complicity of the researcher in terms of the specific spaces and the more general cultural consumerist processes that form them. Next, I would suggest that given the crisis of representation methodology that I have mentioned, as well as the changed status of the researcher, we need focus on forms of research that privilege postmodern experimental and avant-garde tendencies. Experiments in the nature of field work, as I emphasized with the collaborations between Carla Freitag, Grice, and myself earlier, transformations of the written texts that result from such field work, as an example in the my story genre of Gregory Ulmer, and relocations of the site of research from an academic scholarly location in staid, underpopulated 8 a.m. Sunday conference rooms to a popular, collaborative, and ultimately public location, such as that which emerges in the context of public charades employed by architectural and community development firms, these are all opportunities that owe some of their legacies to postmodern, experimental, and avant-garde tendencies in the world at large. Fourth, and related to this last desire to make the study of themed and immersive spaces open to the public, is to imagine ways to give voice to the spaces that we study, their designers, and their users in terms of guests. As Grant McCracken's work indicates, there is incredible value in addressing the cultural, analytical, and researcher models, as quasi as they may be, that are created by actors outside of the research sphere of the ethnographer. New research collaborations, including those between the various and often competing players of consumer spaces, researchers, designers, workers, and guests, these could indeed be imagined. We should also consider ways to address the innovations that are being experienced in popular media and public cultures, particularly as they are changing the ways in which themed and immersive spaces are designed and studied. The work on contemporary branding, such as Kevin Roberts' Love Marks, and on convergence cultures, Henry Jenkins, represents two significant arenas of future collaboration. Fifth, I suggest that there needs to be greater seriousness and attention given to the study of the nuances of themed and immersive spaces. These spaces have been relegated to the junk pile of social research in that they are either not studied at all or they are addressed through simplistic, reductionistic, and essentialist analyses. Sober study of these spaces will entail complex analyses of the design processes that give rise to the spaces, as well as consideration of the ethnographic dynamics of their use by guests. These and many other research protocols suggest the interesting possibility that the innovative, unexpected, and surprising facets of themed and immersive spaces of the future will be paralleled by even more surprising and innovative forms of their research analysis, and criticism. Thank you very much.